Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of circulation, and this is recording part four. <clears throat> it's time to start talking about arterial and venous pressures. We've talked about fluids and the vessels that contain the fluids. And now we can start talking about pressures. We know that in the heart, we have systole and diastole, which causes pulsatile blood flow. On the other hand, at the capillaries, blood flow is completely continuous without any pulsatility at all. What happens in the course of movement of fluid from the heart to the capillaries? We know that during systole, we have high pressures, and in diastole, pressure in the ventricles falls almost to zero. But in the large arteries, pressure does not fall to zero during diastole. A typical blood pressure is like 120 over 80. How do we maintain high pressures during diastole? Well, a portion of the energy that's released by cardiac contraction during systole is stored in these distensible elastic large arteries. And so during diastole, as diastolic pressures fall to zero in the ventricle, the elastic recoil of the vessels converts that potential energy into forward blood flow, and it ensures continuous capillary flow throughout the cardiac cycle. This is an arterial pressure waveform. We can see systole, diastole, and this dichrotic notch, which occurs at the closing of the aortic valve. Mean arterial pressure can be approximated as the product of systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output. So if your systemic vascular resistance, which is like the tightness of your vessels, or your cardiac output drops, mean arterial pressure will drop. Looking at this dichrotic notch, we will see that as we move further and further from the aorta, the dichrotic notch occurs later. We also see as we move further from the aorta, the pulse pressure becomes wider and wider. That is this difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressures. But mean pressure, the average pressure, really doesn't change much until you get to the arterioles. The arterioles, as we said before, are, are the resistance vessels. Their diameter is really regulated by the activity of the vascular smooth muscle, and these variations in diameter allow the body to determine how much blood flow goes to the capillaries of various organs. Together, all of these resistance vessels play a pretty major role in determining peripheral resistance and arterial pressure. The pulmonary circulation is a low-pressure, low-resistance circuit, which accommodates the entire output of the right ventricle. And it's low-resistance, so there's smaller workload for the right ventricle. This chart summarizes what we've discussed, where we have our left ventricle with pressures of systolic 120 and diastolic 0, our large arteries, which still have high systolic pressures, Diastolic pressures are also high because of the closure of the aortic valve. We continue to have forward flow in the arterioles, but we see pressures start to drop rapidly as we get to the capillaries, capillary pressures being maintained around 30 millimeters of mercury. And then finally to the venous compartment, where pressures are close to zero as we get back into the right atrium. The exact same process occurs on the pulmonary or the right-sided circulation but with much lower pressures in order to accommodate the entire output of the right ventricle. <clears throat> how do we measure arterial blood pressure? There are varying data on how reliable each of the methods are. The gold standard is considered to be the invasive arterial line where we place a catheter into an artery. That actually measures the pressures in the system and inaccuracies would be due to a miscalibration or some problem with the position of your transducer, any over or under damping of the signal or other malfunction. The oscillometric method, or the automated blood pressure method, is what we commonly use in the operating room and in most clinical settings nowadays. The mean arterial pressure is measured as the cuff pressure where the maximum pulse amplitude is detected. 
So a cuff is inflated until circulation is completely cut off. It's gradually deflated until the highest pulse pressure is detected, and that is the mean arterial pressure. By looking at the onset and um, loss of oscillatory signals, the system can also estimate systolic and diastolic blood pressure, although these are less reliable. Nevertheless, oscillometric method has been shown to be reliable for detecting hypertension and hypotension and therapy-induced changes in the perioperative period. Inaccuracies in this method would be due to arrhythmias, uh, incorrect cuff sizing, or external pressure on the cuff, like if a surgeon is leaning on the patient's arm. The original method of measuring blood pressure was with auscultation. Here, uh, only systolic or diastolic blood pressure can be measured, whereas mean has to be calculated. The cuff is inflated until there is no blood flow over the artery, and then you listen for carotid cough sounds. Um, and in a very basic way, you're listening for the onset of the carotid cough sounds, which corresponds with your systolic pressure, and the disappearance of the sounds, which corresponds with the diastolic pressure. The mean is calculated by assuming that one-third of the cardiac cycle is spent in systole, and so therefore diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure would give you an approximation for mean. So that's arterial pressure. We could measure pressures in the venous side as well, and the first would be central venous pressure or right atrial pressure. People have tried to use this as an indicator of intravascular volume status, as a surrogate for left or right ventricular and diastolic volume. Although it's a pretty poor indicator, some people may use it to follow trends. If these values significantly increase or decrease, it may be a sign of changes in intravascular volume status. But it really depends on blood flowing into the atrium, which is preload, as well as the ability of the heart to pump blood out of the right atrium, intrathoracic pressures, venous tone, and ventricular compliance. There are other options which may not necessarily be much more reliable, and we'll discuss that in a few minutes. A normal CVP is about zero millimeters of mercury, although it can vary normally between negative five and 30. The reference level for pressure measurements is the level of the tricuspid valve in the right atrium. That's considered the zero point of the system. If you put a central line in and transduce the pressures, you will get a right atrial pressure waveform over time. And here it is shown compared to the cardiac cycle on an EKG. This pressure waveform has certain classic features. It starts with an A wave, which occurs at the end of diastole, and it, it is due to the contraction of the atrium. Then there's a C wave. The C wave occurs in early diastole, sorry, in early systole, and this is as the tricuspid valve is bulging and we start to have ventricular contraction. The X descent occurs in mid systole. At this point, the atrium is relaxing and it will then start to fill. The tricuspid valve is closed at this point. We have the V wave, which occurs in late systole. Here the atrium is filling up and it becomes tense and full, and the tricuspid valve is closed. And finally, the Y descent, which occurs in early diastole. The tricuspid valve opens, the atrium empties, and the, ventric and the ventricle is beginning to fill. Peripheral venous pressures will increase when central venous pressure is increased, or if there's compression by other organs or structures, if there's elevated intra-abdominal pressure, and most commonly, gravity. So for example, this figure on the right shows an adult standing upright. We see right at the level of the heart, uh, venous pressures are about zero. As we move down, venous pressures become higher and higher, and actually above the level of the heart, venous pressures become negative. You can see the sagittal sinus, which is a non-collapsible chamber, actually can have negative pressures. And if it's opened during surgery, air could be sucked in due to the negative pressure, causing venous air embolus. 
On the other hand, if the adult is lying supine, we expect equal venous pressures along the whole length of the body, since the whole body is at the same height of altitude. Now, if we really have venous pressures of 90 in the legs, this would be a problem. And therefore, the body has valves which help overcome these large positive pressures. And any muscle movement due to walking or even just contraction of your muscles squeezes these veins and pushes the blood back towards the heart. And this is called the venous pump. And this maintains a venous pressure under 20 millimeters of mercury in the feet of a walking adult. But if a person stands upright without moving, the venous pump doesn't work and pressures quickly increase here in the lower legs to about 90 millimeters of mercury. This pressure becomes so high that fluid leaks out of the capillaries into the tissue spaces. spaces. The legs can swell and up to 20% of blood volume can be lost from the circulation in 15 to 30 minutes. This is why people who stand straight at attention without flexing their legs can become lightheaded as they lose a significant portion of their intravascular volume into the interstitial space. Varicose veins occur when these venous valves become destroyed, the veins start to balloon, develop high pressures, and more capillary leakage occurs into the interstitial space. Now, the real question that we have to answer so often during our care of patients is, what is the patient's intravascular volume status? What is the tissue perfusion? These are the things that we mostly want to know about as we try to control patients' heart rate and cardiac output and blood pressure. There are a lot of measurable factors that show up on our monitors, but they don't always reflect the real question, which is tissue perfusion. If we look back at our Frank Starling curve, we can assume that a patient on the ascending part of the curve will respond to fluid administration. If I give more fluid administration, their left ventricular and diastolic volume will increase, their stroke volume will increase, and cardiac output will increase. But critically ill patients are often on the flat part of this curve, and they won't respond to a fluid challenge. So how do we measure patients' intravascular volume status? Central venous pressure is a really poor measurement. Slightly better would be pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, also known as pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. But it has limitations in measuring left ventricular preload as well. Many people will use echocardiography, especially transesophageal, TEE. This lets you measure the left ventricular end diastolic area and changes in the vena cava diameter or flow velocities through the aorta. Others have used esophageal Doppler technology to measure velocity through the descending aorta. But each of these has some limitations, and one of the best tools that's available right now is called pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation. The idea is that in a patient who is intubated and paralyzed and receiving positive pressure ventilation, every positive pressure breath will decrease preload and increase afterload of the right ventricle. This will cause a decrease in right ventricular stroke volume. And these changes will be greatest when the ventricle is on the steep part or the fluid responsive part of the Starling curve. And this technology actually works to a high degree of accuracy, predicting patients who are most likely to respond to a fluid challenge. And it may be the most accurate evidence-based tool for guidance of fluid management. So here we see a patient's um, arterial pressure waveform. We see its variability with inspiration and expiration, and this change in pulse pressure will suggest that the patient will respond to a fluid inspiration, a fluid uh, bolus. Now there are some limitations. This doesn't work in patients who have irregular heartbeats or other arrhythmias, and they have to be receiving mechanical ventilation. It may be less reliable in critically ill patients, it can be done with pulse pressure variability or stroke volume variability. It's affected by tidal volume. So the tidal volumes should be at least 8 mils per kilogram in order to really um, determine a significant effect. 
And some are now looking at plethysmographic, plethysmographic variability, which would be looking at the pulse ox waveform. And this technology may also be available to you. That's it for this section. We'll continue in the next recording.